Welcome back to Just Chatting, and this is the series of videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evenings just for our own entertainment. Well, last week I offered to take a look at the allegations of fraud behind the Martin Bashir uh, interview of Princess Diana for Panorama back in 1995. In a lot of ways, this interview was the beginning of the end of Diana's connection with the royal family. And a lot of you said, yes, we got a lot of, hey, I want to hear this. So, as always, no matter what I start out looking for, I go where the research takes me. And in this case, the research took me in some very unexpected directions. So, let's get started when we come back. Now, before we get started, I do want to just very quickly apologize. The last uh, week, I really was not on top of the comments the way I like to be and the way I, I like to think I usually am. Uh, we had a break in the weather. You know, obviously it's February. You expect it's going to be cold in Pennsylvania. We had several warm days and those warm days encouraged massive pollen and I spent four days sneezing. That's just what I did for four days. Oh, I'm sorry. I went to the dentist while I was sneezing, which by the way is an adventure, but it's not one I would wish on anyone. My dentist is very good. I walked out of there with all my teeth intact, which is amazing because I was sneezing the whole time. So my apologies for that. Hopefully it will not be a problem this week. All right, uh, let's get started. Now, the Panorama interview story has a very bizarrely ironic beginning. The beginning was a letter that Charles, uh, Diana's brother, the Earl, Earl Spencer, received exactly two years to the day before Diana's death. That, it's like something like that going in just tells you this is going to be a strange roller coaster ride. And it was. Martin Bashir wrote to Diana's brother Charles, and this was August 31st, 1995, for those of you who have sharp memories, you will recall, I'm sure, that Diana died on August 31st, 1997. Now, I hasten to point out, it was August 31st in Paris where she died, but here in the U.S., her time of death was still August 30th, my birthday, which is why I remember it. So. Two years before, Charles Spencer gets a letter. Martin Bashir, who is a journalist for the BBC, has written to him and said, I'm not looking for an interview, but I came across some information that should be of interest to you. So because it was the BBC and the letter was written, on BBC letterhead, and Bashir's business card was included saying BBC. He carried the credibility of the BBC with him, and Earl Spencer agreed to meet with him, and he did. During the meeting, Martin Bashir produced two receipts. These were bank transfer receipts indicating that Spencer's former head of security 
had taken two pretty significant bribes. One of them, and this was around 4,500 pounds, um, in terms of dollars, that would have been about $7,000 from the 1995 exchange rate. The exchange rate is different now. So of course I had to go back, get a 95 exchange rate, and then do the calculations. The things I do for you folks. And the second was 6,500 pounds, which would be approximately $10,000. Now, these are $1,995, and collectively, this amount, which would have been around 17000 U.S., represented 50% of the median U.S. household income. And the reason I want to throw that in is because the household income has doubled since, so $17,000 doesn't sound like quite as much today as it would have been in 1995. Actually, this was 1994 when these uh, receipts ostensibly were created. Now, it's not an inconsiderable amount of money, and that was what I wanted to determine. How much money are we talking? Was it, um, maybe $17,000 doesn't sound like shoot yourself in the foot money today, but the equivalent, based on that comparison of uh, median household income in the U.S., is about $33,000, $34,000. And that might be shoot yourself in the foot money. It's not small, and it is, in fact, bigger than it appears because of the passage of time. So, the money allegedly came from one the Rupert Murdoch Publishing Empire. That was the $7,000 receipt. Uh, two, an agency that Bashir said was a front for British intelligence. Um, and when we talk about British intelligence, we are talking about MI6. And that is like James Bond, you know, and, and, and M and Q and all that. It's the British version of the CIA. So this is what he hands to Earl Spencer and says, your head of security had these amounts deposited in his name in an offshore account. Well, one is coming from a publishing empire that controlled British tabloids. The other is coming from British intelligence. The conclusion was obvious. Spencer's former head of security was being paid to spy uh, on Spencer, obviously. Now, so Spencer, who is a, an intelligent young man, uh, and I do say young, he would have been about 27, I think, at the time, 27. No, I think he was 27 when his father died. He became Earl. Then in that case, he would have been about 30 at the time. Anyway, young man. Intelligent, though. And suspicious. So the first thing Spencer does is call the BBC. He spoke with the managing director and said, what can you tell me about Martin Bashir? So this managing director, or managing editor, whoever he was over at the BBC, says he's one of our best reporters. He's utterly reliable. So, we can't fault Charles Spencer for what happened next. There was a second meeting. In that second meeting, Bashir brings more receipts. These receipts show similar payments to offshore accounts uh, ostensibly belonging to high-level security people or staff people working for both Prince Charles and Diana. So clearly at this point, Charles Spencer, and I'm sorry, I'm going to call him Carlos. That's what Diana called him. And we've got too many Charleses in this, and I don't want to make this confusing. So 
Earl Spencer's Carlos from here on in. Carlos calls his sister Diana and says, hey, your people are on the take. Oh, we need to talk. Diana, and this is the uh, late summer of 1995, at this point, her own brother described her as unsettled. She was in a fragile state. Her private secretary described her as in a state of high anxiety. We also know that the year before, in 94, um, a book had been published that broke the story of Diana's affair with James Hewitt. People were already saying that Harry was Hewitt's son because of a superficial resemblance between the two. Diana and Hewitt both, uh, yeah, they both denied this. People today still believe it's true. And what can you say? Who knows if it's true? Nobody's done a DNA test. So Diana was in a dreadful situation. Her marriage was in free fall. Uh, one of her affairs had been publicly exposed. She had at least three serious affairs at this point. Uh, the one with Barry Manikey, um, and that was an affair that supposedly began right around the time that Harry was born. And then another affair with an art dealer named, I think it was Christopher Hoare, H-O-A-R-E. So, uh, not W-H-O-R-E. So, Christopher Hoare, and I think it's Christopher, I'm just not sure. Insignificant in the overall scheme of things, that's a digression. Point is, multiple affairs. And it was getting known. So, She's in a bad spot, very bad spot. She and Charles are, are separated. Basically, they're living very separate lives at this point. Diana, for her part, in this period, as I mentioned last week, she believes that Charles is having an affair with Tiggy Leg Burke, the nanny. She believes he previously had an affair with Camilla, but that he is ditching both herself and Camilla, to run off with the nanny. Diana is in a super, super fragile state of mind. Now, when Spencer goes to Diana, he arranges a meeting between Diana and Bashir. And apparently this was Bashir's goal all along. The meeting takes place and... Uh, Carlos Spencer is is at this meeting. Bashir comes up with a story that Spencer describes as, quote, fantastical. At the end of this meeting, Spencer is convinced that Bashir is off the rails. The story is just too crazy for words because you're dragging in MI6 agents and, and hookers and you know, foreign national interests and journalists, and it just, it was this, like, you know, vast conspiracy. And Spencer's radar went up, and he just said, I don't, I don't believe this. And he went to Diana and said, look, I just don't believe the guy's on the level. Diana, however, did take it seriously because she had become very paranoid, and this was plugging into her paranoia. And as I say, we really can't fault her for this, because this is a girl who flunked out of high school. Let's not lose sight of that. You know, she, she simply had to leave high school because she could no longer compete academically. She had worked at three jobs before she got married, one of them was cleaning houses. One of them was as a, a nanny, a babysitter, and the other was at an a, as an aide at a nursery school. So not a nursery teacher. I know some of the tabloids said she was a nursery teacher. No, she was a nursery aide. So basically, all she was, 
qualified for in terms of her skill level, her education, her world experience was cleaning houses or babysitting children. From the time she was 19 and came under the protection of the royal family, everybody was doing everything for her. Just as prior to that, the Spencer family had. This is a woman who, despite the fact that in many ways she was very sophisticated, in many ways she was like a child, like a babe in the woods. She, she believed Bashir. According to her brother, Bashir had a special gift for creating and exacerbating anxiety and fear. And I take Carlos Spencer seriously when he says this, because he did manage to get two meetings with Spencer and a third meeting with Spencer and Diana before Spencer pulled the plug. So, Diana continues to meet with Bashir in secret. And at this point, their first meeting uh, took place September 19th. And uh, that was Char um, Diana and Bashir, September 19th, 1995. By November 5th, they have filmed the interview. So we are looking at, at a period of less than two months. Um, the problem with the interview, and, and we all know about that, and we'll go back and touch on what happened as a result of the interview in other ways. The problem with the interview is as soon as it was aired, a man named Matt Wiesler who was a graphic designer for nine years for the BBC, started calling his friends at the BBC saying, hey, I need to tell you something. Martin Bashir came to me in the middle of August and asked me to create some receipts, and I did this for him. I think the receipts may have been used to secure this interview. So, here's the graphic artist starting to tell people that there were fake receipts, he knows he made them, and that this is probably the leverage Bashir used to secure the interview in the first place. Well, Wessler, Wiesler, that's how you say it, Wiesler, Matt Wiesler, he operated in good faith. As a graphic designer for the BBC, he would have been called on to create things like duplicate receipts all the time. Because, let's face it, you know, you have a, a little receipt and it's faded and you've got a coffee stain on it, whatever. You want to introduce that into a documentary. You need something that's a little more camera ready. So, because I want to forestall any complaints about who is he, he's a forger, no, no. He was a graphic artist doing his job, and this is a perfectly ordinary job in graphic design. Um, he believed that he was simply producing camera-ready versions of receipts Bashir already had. Um, he, and, and of course, he's the one that blew the lid off this even though no one took him seriously at the time. He went to people at the BBC and said, you need to look at this. You know, I want you to just, you know, please. So people at the BBC took Wiesler's complaints to higher ups and said, look, this is what the graphic artist says. Well, the BBC went back to Bashir and said, what's the deal with these receipts? And Bashir denied everything. 
um, you know, receipts, what receipts? I never showed receipts to anybody, blah, blah, blah. And um, he apparently made a total of three documented denials that he had ever shown the receipts to anyone before he finally admitted that he had shown these receipts to Earl Spencer. The interview aired November 20th. By March 1996, it's like three, four months later, there were enough complaints running around the BBC to attract the attention of the Mail on Sunday. And the Mail on Sunday located Matt Wiesler. And he told them the same thing he had been saying all along. I made these receipts. This is my work. So the Mail on Sunday began piecing uh, the chain of activities together, uh, linking it up. Fake receipts to open the door to Carlos Spencer, who in turn opens the door to Diana. Uh, the receipts show staff being paid to spy on her. Naturally, she is going to become paranoid. Well, she was already pretty paranoid. It's just going to make her believe that she was 100% correct about her fears and pushed her into an interview, which she probably felt she was doing in her own self-defense. So, the BBC has, at this point, um, statements from Bashir, including, by the way, a letter from Diana swearing that he never showed her any documents, that was what she said, and that she stood behind the, uh, the interview. She was pleased with it, stood behind it. Now, of course, as her brother pointed out, what is that even worth? Uh, the letter she wrote when she'd been lied to repeatedly, um, in effect terrorized into believing everyone around her was spying on her and just waiting to take her children away. It's important to remember that was Diana's big fear, that if she was made to look bad enough, if there was enough spying and false evidence and probably true evidence because she was having affairs and she's admitted this, that Buckingham Palace would find a way to take her kids. She was terrified of that. Um, whatever else was going on in Diana's life, she was absolutely devoted to her children. So, at this point, the Mail on Sunday is ready to go ahead with their story about the false receipts. They go back to the BBC, they show the BBC what they've got, and the BBC interviews Bashir again. He said all kinds of things that, that were patently false but the BBC never checked his story. He did the same thing with them that he did with Earl Spencer, with Diana Spencer. He just wove a web of bizarre lies and nobody ever bothered to check it out at the time. The things that he said, that someone has subsequently made an effort to verify have been proven false. Mail on Sunday shoots the story. This, the entire interview was based on a scam, and immediately the BBC comes out in defense of Bashir. They say that these are just lies spread by Bashir's jealous colleagues. Wow. The Panorama interview gets many awards 
Diana's relationship with the royal family is torpedoed. During the interview, Diana openly admitted to at least one affair. She said that she did not think Charles should be king, that the succession should go from Elizabeth straight to William. Uh, she said that Buckingham Palace was trying to get rid of her. Now keep in mind, part of this three or four months earlier was her own insecurities manifesting as paranoia. However, most of it was nonsense Bashir put in her head in order to manipulate her into giving this interview. I don't know about the rest of you, but I saw that interview and I said to myself, good God, the woman shot herself in the foot. Why would she do this? This is crazy. Wasn't there anyone to say no? And there wasn't. Because Bashir told her, her closest, most trusted advisors, the people who would have stopped her if they had known about it, were all in league against her. They were all pawns of British intelligence or the Murdoch publishing empire. Diana believed she didn't have a friend in the world. She believed that the palace was conspiring to take her children. So, yes, that's why she shot herself in the foot, because it was a last-ditch effort to sort of go straight to the public and say, look at this. I don't think it was sensible, no matter how provoked she felt. But that's Monday afternoon quarterbacking. I don't know what I would have thought, you know, in, say, October of 1995, if I had seen all the evidence she saw, keeping in mind that it was all fraudulent and it was further um, elaborated upon with complete lies, absolute fiction about conspiracies that never existed. What would I have done when confronted with that? I might have shot myself in the foot too if I thought someone was taking my kids. So, was Diana tricked into the interview? Oh, yes, big time. Uh, the BBC subsequently did an investigation. 25 years too late, but they did it. And they issued an apology to Carlos Spencer. It's too late to issue an apology to Diana. So what happened afterward? The aftermath of the interview, her personal secretary, who, um, this was uh, Commander Patrick Jeffson, who would, would have been the person to help guide her through difficult decisions, relationships with Buckingham Palace, etc. He resigned. Uh, he had specifically been mentioned by Bashir as someone plotting against her, so Diana's trust for him was no longer there. He was forced out of his job. You know, he did in fact resign, but he did it because he had no other choice at this point. Within a month of the interview, the Queen had said she wanted Charles and Diana to get a divorce. In getting a divorce, Diana lost all of her security, her protection. I, and I don't just mean physical protection. Security is one thing, but she had all kinds of protection from the, the, the apparatus of the royal family, uh, people who helped her decide uh, what events to go to, uh, manage her life in a very real way. And remember, this is someone who went from a very cosseted environment as the daughter of an earl 
very protected, to becoming the fiancé and later the wife of the Prince of Wales with only a tiny window of less than a year of living on in London where she had friends and family nearby to help her out as well. She was not prepared to go out into the real world. She did not know who to trust. She did not have the real world skills she needed to keep herself safe. She probably would have had a difficult time dealing with the real world if she had an ordinary life like ordinary people, but she didn't. She had a very extraordinary life with everyone grabbing at her and pulling her in every possible direction. So if in an ordinary life it would have been difficult for her to cope with all this on her own without the guidance and the support she had always had, imagine how much worse it is with the front page life she had. Two years later, she's dead in a tunnel in Paris, and her brother traces that step by step back to Martin Bashir. And I have to say, I've looked at it, and I don't believe that Carlos Spencer is that far off the mark. Um, now, unfortunately, we've run out of time. And I am only halfway through the story. So I'm going to finish the second half of this on Sunday evening. Martin Bashir didn't just take down one of the great icons of the late 20th century. He took down two. So that story is coming Sunday. Like I say, I go where the research takes me. All right. I, I so wish we had more time and that I didn't have to break this into two parts, but it is what it is. Have a terrific day. I look forward to seeing you Sunday when we go on to the next stage in the career of Martin Bashir, Icon Destroyer. Have a terrific day. We're going to see a slideshow on our way out.